Okay, we're recording. Hello, world. Welcome wow. back. Is Am this I take frozen? one? I guess this is oh. take two. Oh, take two. Sorry. But for, we'll, we'll say to the universe, we're here. <laughs> yes, we are here. <laughs> I'm in my box. I'm in my box. There. Very much like the, the Brady Bunch, you know? You're like, I don't, I gotta worry about my headroom again now. It's yeah. so weird. I don't like, I, I don't like where that, um, that sailing boat is going off, but maybe that forces you to think, where is that sailing boat mm, going? Yeah. And the chair should have a, where's the chair? The chair should have a dog in it. That was going to be the, you know, kind of the offset. And I was going to center punch this thing, kind of like a Maisel thing, but maybe I should go more about, I'm so smart. Ooh, I, I like the book. I like the bookshelf of books. Yeah, but I took all the books down because we're, we may be moving, but we, so we, there were a lot more a books. In between. There are many books here. I can all said, I am smart books. But anyway. Um, well, for people at home that don't recognize this man by his books or lack thereof, yeah, we have the is. lovely, ooh, I like pan there, uh, Jimmy McConkey here. Mm -hmm. That's uh, me. And I was wondering um, if you wouldn't mind giving a little brief rundown of how you started in this career and how you got going. Oh. I'll try to do the short one because it's yeah. crazy. Because I, first of all, never wanted to graduate from college because I was lucky. I had two parents who both taught at, an, at a college, an Ivy League college. And that meant that it was, I'm sorry, I'm sorry about this. It was free. But it also meant I had to go there. Um, but it also meant that I didn't know what I wanted to do in life. And so if I kept taking classes and not got graduating, I can keep staying there, sort of, and uh, so I would take every course I possibly could at that university at Cornell, and um, it led me off to a lot of places, and one of them was uh, dendrochronology, analysis of tree rings, but the real reason I took it is because um, I really wanted to go to the Near East. I wanted to go to Northern Greece and uh, I wanted to go to Syria, I wanted to go to Turkey, I wanted to go to that area. And this research took you there. So I went there and, uh, and basically was dealing with getting tree ring data, drilling or slicing or dicing or whatever. And then the, later, <laughs> every season led to two years of backlog of stuff. You'd have to analyze it and measure it and all this kind of stuff and work out these chronologies. But it was great for me is that we were in um, Demer, uh, no, where we were? We were in uh, Istanbul, in Hagia Sophia. And it was my job, because I no one else wanted to do it, to get in a bosun's chair with a Swedish increment bore and a, and a drill, and to drill the lintel beams of these windows and uh, to get these cores. And so I loved that job, and I was way up there. And one day I looked down, and this group of people came in. And there was, uh, from afar, it was very colorful. And there were people with mats for jumping. And there were weird-looking props. There was a woman seemed very scantily clad, I thought, uh, uh, and a man who was in a giant robe and had gloves on made out of tires, I found out later. Um, and so I went down, and I just had to know. And I talked to the guy who seemed to be having the most fun. He had a deep, dark tan. And it turns out he was a stunt coordinator of a small English Turkish co-production and called Lion, I don't remember if it was man or woman, Lion Man, Lion Woman, no, Lion Woman 2. And I said, oh my, you know, I've never heard of this Lion Woman movie. Um, wh where can I watch uh, the one? I, I want to see it. And he said, oh, there, there's no one. They call it two, so people think it was, a, you know, successful. And so we're doing two. And so... Uh, he then proceeded to tell me um, all about filmmaking, and I was thinking about my life, and, uh, you know, it was research and doing great things, but, you know, to get published in the academic world, you have to have a professor who works with you, and he takes credit, and you sort of, and someday you might get this, and, and I knew this from my dad's world, my mom's world, so uh, I came back with that knowledge, thinking that was really cool, and guess what, my older brother... Larry happened to be doing a documentary, musical documentary about Sonny Rollins. And it was an album that had just come out called uh, uh, Saxophone Colossus. 
And so he was shooting a uh, performance at Opus, what's it called up in Socrates? I keep saying it wrong. Is he Opus 30 or Opus 90? I keep getting it wrong. I forgot the name too. I, I feel like I do know it because I grew up upstate, but I... Yeah. It's like a quarry that's been converted into a performance space. Oh, um, but it doesn't matter. I, anyway, I went up there, you know, he said, you want to work as a PA or something? And I didn't know what a PA is, but I said, I'll, I'll come up there. There were four uh, cameras, three cameras. I don't remember. One, one of the cameramen was Wayne De La Roche, who was an old, a friend who did National Geographic documentaries and he had his own Aton. And then my brother had a CP-16 and uh, two CP-16s, and I think. And then there, there was, they were all like independent cameramen who were coming together to do this music documentary uh, uh, for Bob Muggy, who did these sort of things. Oh, the dogs are going out to attack somebody. Um, so uh, um, I didn't know much except that um, they gave me a job of running the magazines from the loader out to different cameras, and they were different cameras. So. I sort of had to, you know, I had to learn that kind of, oh, no, I gave, I gave that wrong. So um, uh, I, I, I ended up running everything that way and all day long. And um, it was such a fun experience to me because I love that connection to music because I grew up playing the piano as my brother did. We had the same music teacher playing. The, uh, and, and so I, I've always had this connection to music. Um, and uh, so, so we were uh, doing that for, for, I don't know, a couple hours. And at one point, Sonny Rollins was playing the saxophone, and he's up on that eight-foot-tall platform of rock, and he stepped backwards and fell. And he fell down and hit his, hit his back, I guess. And, and all we saw from our angle were two feet of his feet sticking out. And it's like the audience and us, we didn't really know if this – I mean, this can't be this can't be real. First of all, this must be a stunt, or because we don't know. And so we're there for about two or three seconds, frozen. Which is some. It's a weird thing, you know. You wonder on retrospect. We should have just. We should have. But we weren't sure. It was like we were. All, and so um, his foot is still. And all of a sudden, his foot started to. It's like if this was his foot. This is the frame. It was like a, there was a cliff here, and his foot came out. Yeah. It was like that. And all of a sudden, there was nothing happening. We were like, oh, we're about to run over. And then we see this. Boom, 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 boom. And he started tapping to the music that his guys, he told his guys to keep playing, I guess. And then they kept, and he started, then he sat up, as far as I remember, and started playing the saxophone. No, he didn't sit up. We had to move our camera position to see him better. And he, was, he played the rest of the concert on his back. Uh, it was... Uh, I don't know. There's something about that, and uh, he 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 needed to perform. <laughs> he needed to finish, and everybody. And then an ambulance came later and took him. He had broken his leg. Um, he was okay, I guess, but he broken his leg and everything. But that experience was crazy. I mean, uh, for a lot of reasons, my my brain is starting to fire and all these things. What should we? Do? And uh, at the, at the end of the day, I remember I walked up to the car, helping my brother load all his gear, flags and stands and lights and uh his camera equipment and you know a little bit overwhelming and all those guys who came in from new york with him in this gaucho van and he um you know and then bob muggy came up and and he said well open your palm you know and i remember he just twenty dollar twenty dollar twenty dollar twenty dollar twenty dollar twenty dollar i don't remember if it was 120 or 140 dollars i but it was cash and he put in my palm he said thank you and I said, "What? What's this for?" And it's like, because you did a great job, and and you helped create this thing, and um, I appreciate that. And 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 nobody has to work for free. This is a country that supports the arts, and I'm supporting the arts, and you're part of the arts. I didn't that little moment. I didn't really have the full effect of it until a lot later, because it washed over to me that it had changed. That one moment had changed my life because I didn't understand that there were so many things you could do in life and that you, you have this idea of where you want to go. And so you plot this out. You want to be a doctor. You want to be a lawyer. You want to be a, this, that, this, whatever. But um, I didn't have it all spelled out in my mind. And so it was sort of opening up that 
here's this thing that has to do with performance and creativity and music. Uh, and um, you could be a part of that in some function. So that blew me away. And so I went back not knowing what I was doing in my life anymore because I got done with uh, Cornell. And uh, so I decided I went to New York City and uh, armed with um, 10 pairs of cross country skis because I was a cross country skier, very, fairly competitive cross country skier at the time. I was really in good shape back then, boy. Um, <laughs> but um, not realizing it didn't snow really and, 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 and consistently. So anyway, um, and then um, that same guy, Wayne De La Roche, uh, who did documentaries, he, um, he started hiring me as a kind of a PA or whatever, because was, I wasn't in the union, to help him on these Japanese commercials. Uh, 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 so that there were all these weird commercials we did, like the giant Cetus aspirin that was wheeling itself down the Guggenheim Museum and had no, or Harrison Ford in a hat selling um, a Rinnemann vitamin drink, I think. Or we would do these weird, subjective, weird things that had nothing to do with the product and it was all about an air conditioner. We were shooting Broadway and it was about an air conditioner. Yeah. And it was, and they all we seemed to be like, behind the times visually so that all they were all shot and whatever happened had happened five years before or whatever so mm. that was kind of crazy and then i started getting employed by them and then um because my brother is in this business and he's fairly well known okay that helps but uh it has it gets you in the door but it doesn't uh, it doesn't uh, keep you there that's for sure um then then uh jimmy Miro, who is steady cam operator who was going on to be a director. Um, he, he was the operator for Cameron on Titanic. And, well, I mean, he basically out of the blue said, you know, you're, you, you, know you know, you know, Larry, so uh, you must be good. I'm just doing a horrible Jimmy accent, but I just remember, you know, you, you, you're Larry's brother, so you must be good. I didn't know anything. And so he asked me to come do a music video with him. Full oh, Focus it was a non-union thing years ago. Salt and Peppa, I think. And uh, we were in a club, and uh, CP, uh, no, it was the SR, the uh, first SR one. And uh, I had done the checkout, supposedly, for it, and I realized I got there, and there was no battery that had, you know, there used to be there was a battery you would click on to the little L-shaped deal that would go into the XLR port. Um, I hadn't gotten that. So uh, <laughs> I remember calling my brother up, and we didn't have cell phones, and I had 25 cents, and I remember calling him up in the back room and Larry, so I'm on this job. I, I just think, well, you don't have the thing, the thing, the thing. And I said, no, <laughs> I, I don't. What do I do? Well, you know, you need the thing, the thing, the thing, and you're back, you know, you know I won't be able to get it. Well, you, know, you got to you just get a, get a cable and, you, you know, whatever, plug it in and tape the thing on. And so um, I, I did all this stuff. And then Jimmy, I remember, was like, Again, we'll get the real thing. And then sent off somebody who got it back, but we did it, and it was all okay. Um, but I didn't know how to pull focus really at all, and so I had. I do not recommend anyone doing what I did because <laughs> I just got like in a helicopter, dropped off in the middle of boom, pull focus, do this, do all, that. and that it was like. But much like somebody taking a baby, not a baby, okay. The adult, <laughs> throwing them into the water and you either swim or yeah. swim. I had to swim or not dr man and um, years later I remember going to Cornell on a symposium about people who were in filmmaking and my old professor asked me what is your advice um, uh, you know people I say don't say no don't say no and then figure out whatever it is you need to find out to know that something that lets you get through it but you'll never have an experience that will teach you or will make you really understand unless you actually are doing it. I mean, it just isn't the same. The books, this, the, get thrown into it. So I learned in my life by being thrown into things well before I was able. So the next thing that happened is I had to get a steady cam and I used to, to borrow one from Ian Wilson Smith or something. I'd always cobbled together these weird things of, of equipment at the last second and um, I did music videos. I did so many rap videos. I was in that golden age of rap videos. I've done so many rap videos that. Um, God, you miss I, them in a way. 
You may you know, that time. They were wonderful little um, moments of time that have been as a bubble uh, kept alive. Um, Fat Five Freddy, I just I saw him the other day. And he was like, oh my God. It was like going back in time. It was, um, you know, I did all these salt and pepper, TLC. Oh God, every Billy Ocean, of course, this doesn't sound. Um, Sade was my very first DP credit on, on stuff I shot in Miami. Um, uh, they all, music gave me opportunities that were well beyond what I deserved to actually do. Uh, um, and so I use music as a metaphor through slicing through life and trying to get to better and better things. And so, you know, name special ed, I'm a super duper star. Every other day I buy, a, okay, I'm not gonna, I'm embarrassing myself, but you know, <laughs> Benita, 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 you got going on. Or my philosophy, Karis One or Run DMC, Ron's house, that was Joe DeSalvo. And then I was assisting him, but then I would actually knew what I was doing. And then Joe helped me get into SETI camp. Um, man, so many people, you know, maybe it's a love for my brother, or maybe it's a love for, I, I know what it is not. It's about um, when people love seeing other people learn and experience and give them opportunities. Yeah. I think one of the biggest joys in my life right now is if I can be helpful in some piece of someone's life and getting uh, to a different place. Um, the SOC uh, is now uh, got me in their mentorship program, so I've, I'm on my second mentor now who i'm supposed to meet with today at uh, three i hope <laughs> um we'll see if it works out but that's been a really fabulous relationship and i've been very lucky i've had a, a series of uh, b camera operators and even second acs and different people who i could tell had something special to offer or were well able to be well beyond who they what they were doing and yeah. so I really thought it important to to try. I don't know if I do it, but I try to give back and to try to help. And yeah. it makes me feel better about myself. It also makes me feel, feel better about this business um, because uh, we're not alone. And because I am alone and you're alone and we're all alone together right now. But yeah. um, I think it's uh, you, one thing I realized is that whatever you do in life, it is only better through the cooperation and collective mind of uh, uh, and truly creative people utilize other truly creative people and and that there's a synergy and that thing just builds and builds and I could give you examples why you know look the most recent thing I've been doing consistently is is Maisel marvelous Maisel and um, that's blown me away in terms yeah. of what I can and can't do and uh, I have to almost be careful what I suggest because there's people involved who just will believe in you. And that's the other thing that's important about this business is if you find and collect and be around people who believe in you because yeah. there's so much negativity in this world. And it's so easy for all of us to listen to that in the back of our brain. And that is the reason why we can't. That is the reason why we won't. This is why it's not going to happen. And it's all crap. You know, it's like just how you want to listen to who you want to listen to. So find the people who don't do that and try to be with them. And, and so, uh, you know, I've got, I've got a, you know, a director and a showrunner and we're a married couple and amazing writers. And I've got a DP who can light almost anything. I won't bury him uh, because he's too smart. And uh, I, I feel like I can say whatever I want. And, and with the years of experience I've had at this point, Kind of like tying that tie. Oh, so that's the thing about why people are good or not good at what they do. I'm not saying people are not good, but I'm just saying what makes a good operator. And I was this conversation with Jeff Haley that was so amazing that we both had this realization that here's the thing. You know, when you're um, an operator and you're on a job and you have a frame, this is how my interview was uh, for Men in Black 3. I had to show him this frame and then he hired me. Um, because that's that's what he wanted to see. There you go. Um, but uh, the thing about uh, framing and what it does is just it's so visceral. It depends on the project. But um, um, music. Wait a second. Can I do this? I can, can sort of do. It. 
I don't know what I was saying. What was I saying? I lost my well, train Well, you on. were talking about your relationship with Jeff Haley, who worked on The Joker, for anyone that doesn't know Jeff's name. And oh. um, that's something that maybe we were mentioning before we recorded, but that relationship you have with other operators and other people that are as deeply passionate as you are. Well, Talk about the quality both, of... Yeah, we, we both use music in, in, a, in, a, in a very interesting way. It's like, uh, I can't remember 10 pages of dialogue. I mean, I don't know how Rachel does it, but I, I, I and and the banter and and so I turn their dialogue into music. Uh, so what I hear is boom, I'm swear to God, I turn dialogue into music because it's also emotion because they're expressing things so i turn the music also if they're happy it's like and if they're sad it's like oh it's angry it's like, ah. so um if i recompose it in my head as music um i stop worrying about the words as much as it is of of what it is i can respond to in a different way it's just weird and I, I just find that that show, I know, like, boom, ba boom, ba 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 I mean, it, 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 it blows you away. Um, uh, it, there's, there's a thing that happens when you're, you're in that um, factory job of television, which is, I'm thankful it exists, believe me. But you have to be careful uh, not to get buried into these rituals of the behavior. Uh, which mm. are kind of confining in a way because it's always the same thing. Um, in regards to the politics of it or uh, in regards it, to like just being stuck eight on days, Eight day schedule, right? So, mm. you know, whatever. Could be 14 days, doesn't matter. This is the shot we're worried about. It's usually a director who's not, who if they're, if they're not the showrunner, they're a guest. They want to get invited back. So as we all know, they're going to get enough material that the editors, you know, have access to that they, they can solve their problems. And that's similar to what they've done in the past. So we'll work out this beautiful shot, beautiful master that does and does and does. And truthfully, if you think about it correctly and you were able to achieve it correctly and the actors were in on it and everybody's in on it, you could do incredibly powerful, powerful things. But what happens is, oh, don't tighten up there. Why don't tighten up there? Oh, because we're going to do a two shot, a single and a single. So, you know, in other words, you're frame, you're, you're doing the frame of the master now to allow for, for that, right? Instead of doing something that does that and then maybe goes into that and on a look goes to the other person, pulls back and then so that if it's done well, it could be brilliant. But it's not how we do things. So they, you do the master, and then they stick at the last second the B camera in on a zoom lens, and they go in, and they go bam, bam, bam. Oh. And if they have a third camera, they stick another one. And to me, that's just not creative. I'm sorry. I mean, it do you feel that, that difference more with, with TV versus like film or with music videos, where it could maybe be a bit more organic, or is that just your experience on certain jobs? Well. Certain jobs that have been around forever, that's how they have to do them. I mean, it's a pattern. Yeah. Pattern set, that's what you do. But um, the thing is, is that I've always tried to inject some possibility of, and, and when, if I do and able to get something in and people, oh, let's do one take the way you want to do it, maybe, and I do it. And then I find uh, seven times out of ten, they'll use that. Uh, I remember doing a sequence on a show where I was lucky enough to have my brother cover me and uh, because it was really hard to do. And, and, uh, and I did the, the whatever it was the day before. It came in the next day and I was on something else. And um, they had him do a shot, uh, which was very reminiscent of his shot in uh, uh, Silence of the Lambs, uh, following somebody through space and seeing what they don't see and revealing. So the director did a smart thing. They had Larry do it the way he interpreted it. The door opened and coming in. It was so mysterious and frightening because you just, like he was there and then you go past and what the hell? And then you come back, find him again. All that stuff lent to this drama that was just 
created because of a continuity of the emotion. You're not cutting. So, because my once you cut, you, you kind of diffuse that other shot. It's like, okay, now we're looking at that. And your brain takes a half a millisecond to go, oh, okay, there we are. Okay, there we are. Nothing that's very important. That's, I'm not saying it's bad stuff. I'm just saying when single shots are done effortlessly and powerfully, um, they should need coverage because you should be taken along for that ride as a storyteller. And look, the truth is, if the blocking isn't good and the acting isn't as good as it could be, if the camera work isn't maybe not perfect, if, if everything aligns in your favor where, where, where things don't need to be fixed later, you can end up with something that's brilliant. That takes having a group of people who are kind of at a higher level. I get that, uh, but it's possible. Anyway, so he did the shot with the actor. It all leads down to him opening the basement and tilting down the stairs, darkness, push the camera, darkness, and then he comes back into the frame and then disappears off to the side and thud, you know, something like that. So they did that. But now they had to do the, the network version. So, um, which is just the second you know that you do that, you've, you've ruined it. So it, it's like they don't want to tell you. So you go in and then you do that, whatever. So what well, ended up on the air, was, first of all, that shot took two minutes and four seconds. I remember the director coming up to me and said, don't be disappointed. We had to do what the network wanted. Um, and so I said, oh, okay. So I saw it. I timed it. The version they did was um, two minutes and six seconds. And all they did is take all the takes he did and chop them up in so that they had cuts in weird places. And then there was one moment of some weird uh, point of view they shot somewhere else with some of the camera. And I wish I could right now show you these two scenes side by side and let you say what would you choose. And I think a lot of choices come out of a fear of doing something that isn't consistent. And I get that. I understand. But, uh, Do you feel like you that's a, to... a top-down thing? Like, is there someone in the, like a showrunner or an editor or producer somewhere that's like, oh, that could be a bit too risky for audience? Well, I, 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 I hope um, it's a combination of them all. But um, I'm hoping that I don't get in trouble and too many editors won't get mad at me. But I haven't noticed that. When you have an actor on a show, a big show, um, and they're well known and they're well paid, and uh, when you start with a wide shot, if there's any other tighter shot of that actor, um, they will go to it because it's tighter. Now, what happens is that it's a constriction because what happens is things will end up getting tighter and tighter, and they'll always use the tighter shot, tighter, tighter, getting tighter, tighter, tighter. Yeah. Tighter, getting even tighter. It gets so tight that you only back up when there's the resolution of the scene or when there's a moment for another actor who comes into the scene. So boom, so they use that. Now, that, look, I get it. It's storytelling, but um, I'm just in my mind, I, I'm going to a different place at this point, and, uh, and, and that's why I'm kind of scared of when we get going again with Maisel, because. Amy is like, you, you can do a 15-minute shot? You can, wait, can you be on a crane? Can you be dispense, suspended from a crane? And drop? Well, yeah, but you have, we now have electric, uh, uh, we've got magnetic release systems. We can do things in there. Yeah, but I like it when only you do it. I like one person. So it's like, um, I don't know what's going to happen, but, but, but uh, things are getting longer and longer. And, uh, you know, I'm going to stay in better and better shape. I mean, I'm biked every single day since we shut down and I'm, I'm doing okay well actually i have a, a specific question for you oh good uh when you work on set and you build these relationships and get to be very creative and collaborative with the people around you can you speak to those exact memories say or those exact projects where you and the cinematographer or you and the director like really were hand in hand because I feel like sometimes it's, it's either, it's one of two things, right? It's like just the camera team, like a bubble or like the whole orchestra, you know, how like we're all in this big thing together. So just was curious if we could talk about those like individual relationships for a bit. Well, you know, again, it comes down to people and how they feel comfortable proceeding with things. 
Um, and I've been in situations where things are total chaos and the whole show is dedicated to the continuation of chaos. So they don't really need somebody to simplify the chaos because, um, but there are other shows, you know, that are, that are done differently that, um, years ago I did a movie called Tom and Huck. Um, well, I shouldn't mention the name, I can't, now I can't tell the story. But I didn't understand a lot of times why they never wanted the, um, me in rehearsals or the DP. Um, and, you know, it was only years later that it was just, there was such an intimidation with who the actors were and the director. It was such a sort of a, a weird feeling that they only brought us in after they had figured out what they wanted. But then the DP said, but yeah, if we do that, then that is the problem and this is the problem. And I was saying, but we're on this side of the line, then we get on that side of the line. And it took a lot of re-engineering every day. It was a lot of work. Um, I've noticed on some TV sets what happens is they'll have a rough blocking without anybody in the room. The DP hopefully is in there. Um, and depending on who the director is, who wants to listen or doesn't want to listen, or has their own specific idea and storyboard was great. Um, that'll, that'll, that'll go on. Then all of a sudden the AD and the AD is the one who you need to make friends with because they control functionality on that set and whether you can actually do your job because in very short order as an operator, whether it's your fault or not, everything's uh, your fault <laughs> or, or your solution or whatever it is. Um, so then everybody comes back in, everybody. And now we're watching it all sometimes, including the operator for the very first time. And so there's a discussion with her Trump, and then there's no real discussion of shots. And then all of a sudden, okay, that's, uh, that's Cruz got it. Uh, and then I was like, what are we doing? I mean, and you have to be careful how you say that because it puts the spotlight on the people who are supposed to be coming up with a plan. And so, you know, it says, and then all of a sudden, everybody in the department does their job. They're lighting and they're, because there's been some rough discussion but I saw, I saw what they were doing and how can they put a light there if I'm going to do that? And what, isn't that what we're doing? Or are we breaking this down into a hundred different shots or whatever? And so I think there's a, there's a tendency on some shows where you end up doing that kind of approach and then you start using the second team and you're demonstrating what something might be better and then, or not, or, uh, or it clarifies the process for the director of how they need to cut it. Or, or the DP, what he wants to do live. And, um, and then there's a kind of a relight and reconfigure and everything and it goes on and then all of a sudden, that's how that time is, gets used. Um, Maisel has been amazing to me because um, uh, I have a um, Artemis video viewfinder, which is an iPad that has the actual lens on it and I can record um, for myself and the director and the DP. And, uh, so we'll go into a room with all the actors and usually it's uh, the directors and the DP and me. And, you know, sometimes there'll, there'll be a boom operator hiding, you know, see what might be coming up and, and, and the, 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 the key, key grip and the gaffer might find a place to look, you know, but they're trying to leave it empty. That's the ideal thing and quiet. And so they're working out all this stuff. As this is happening, um, because those directors are so good at blocking and at energy and emotion, they're, they're walking around, they're seeing, and I know wherever Amy or Dan goes, that's where they're seeing the camera. So I'm seeing it, David's seeing it, and it starts to make sense to me, and then I know what my physicality needs to be. Yeah. So I, or David, will may go up to Amy and whisper in here, it doesn't matter if these guys are like this, can it, can it be like this or stagger? Because then we can do and that. Oh yeah, let's try that. So things have not cemented like concrete yet, which is what happens in most shows. What's the shot? What's the shot? And then it turns very quickly into concrete. That's the shot. Can't change it. Our day, you know, we got time, we got to go. And so, you know, either you figure this out when it's figure or outable, or you you're locked so it's the most valuable time is during that rehearsal watching the director and with that finder finally what's so amazing is that dan won't push me around as much as amy will but we'll we'll, we'll start doing the blocking i'll start to record one and i just do what i think 
feels right and then she'll push me and pull me and push through and then while she's doing telling Rachel back 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 oh shit sit down and then and all these things are happening that are actually very complicated and then and then the guy should and then, you know he's like okay and then he goes out of frame so you don't want to follow him this is my problem that David really need I try to you don't want to follow him because we're going to the next you can't you can do yeah. So let's follow them and we go in the next room and we go there and we do this and that. And then come back, well, let's keep following. So we go in that one and then <laughs> it, 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 it expands. Now I know that that is uh, not, <laughs> I'm not saying it, everybody. really have an opinion on it. I'll turn it. You get the dogs out because the the it's the guy who is uh, delivering peaches from these are Georgia peaches coming. What's the edit feature you said you had? Oh, the pause button. Let me try it. Uh, I'll come back. Oh no! Look at that. It it we we willed it. Yeah. Well, so, I have to say that's that's something that. I don't think a lot of people understand about film sets when they're not on it. And it's hard to fully explain that and communicate that without it getting very technical. Like we're using this equipment or there are these technicians that do this. It's really that like special sauce of when you have personalities and different leadership styles and just like life experience all come into the same space and make something really exciting together. It, it, um, one of the things that I'm not, it's not, again, I don't want to sound like a big, anti-person negative about this, but one of the things that happened to me um, was that when we would go through American Cinematographer and you'll see these articles and about these brilliant movies and brilliant shots and they will have maybe diagrams and all these, you know, where they put the lights and do this and how they saw this and that and why they did this and why they did that. And it's like a fait complete. It's like how to, you know, it's like, God, these guys are brilliant. They're brilliant because they figured all this, how do they figure all this stuff out? And the thing is, is that they may have, there are people out there who, who are that good. And I'm not saying that's not possible, but a lot of times what happens with me is that there's a discussion, an emotional idea about how to do a shot, and then we start going through it, and, and um, you can't pan right. Why can't I pan right? Because if you pan right, you're going to see that thing. I need that for, for light coming in. And like, okay. Then I... Um, that has this loud in their ears. <laughs> Bye. It's nice. The peaches are good, though. I only get them once a year. Um, so, the, what was I talking about? A anyway, um, what was I talking about? Oh, but when the, when, when certain, like, trade magazines oh, private so, like, set thing. A lot of times you go on a set and you can't do this, can't do that. And the directors are, well, I want you to be able to do that. Well, then we got to discuss it because then I have to go through that window and that. So the EP, well, maybe there's a way I could put it up here and do a bounce and not and use it just an effect instead of it being a key through the thing. So that okay, that got figured out. And then we do this, and there's a myriad of things about shots that are about people communicating on the day, and not that they know what the shot is. This has all been discussed. It's everything, but the actual intricacies of how to solve things are very human in the sense that um, it takes me talking to you, you talking to me, we all talking together, coming up with creative solutions, and sometimes new ideas are born out of those discussions. Well, why do I have to stick with them? Can, I, can we just lose that person and come around and find that line and that person who brings me back into the set? And whoa, what would that look like? Well, like this. Awesome, that's so much better. I mean, that doesn't happen all the time, but I'm just saying that could happen. And so what ends up happening, what's on the screen, what's in the magazine, isn't really truthful to the process of how it was discovered. So then I did this wonderful thing that um, the uh, SOC um, did, um, which was the Society of Operating Cameramen. They gave me this shiny award this year for, for being a good operator. And 
I didn't know anything about this stuff really. And then I went down there and I met all these other operators who I never get to, to see because I'm usually the only operator. And we got to talking and it was like, whoa. Anyway, uh, they then started, uh, Mitch Dubin started, and uh, he's the current uh, president, this, this, this class, online class, uh, 10 classes for AFI, for students, with the idea of helping new directors, people who want to direct their own material, um, understand what operators do. Because a lot of people don't. They say, oh, can the DP operate? I'm going to operate, or whatever. And they don't understand um, what we necessarily do as, an ex as, a, as a, a, a skilled or uh, seasoned operator as opposed to just picking up a camera, whatever. Uh, and we broke it down into 10 sections and my deal was with the, about the dolly grip. So I had my dolly grip from Maisel and I had, um, I had um, um, a fellow, fellow operator. Um, we, we all spent, we, we edited video clips together and we had students and what I realized is that if they just watch uh, footage of amazing shots, it's like we've seen them in the theater mm. okay but how do you do them but then if you show shots and then maybe side by side the making of or talk about how these problems are it's like accessible now and then the the questions just change and they feel connected and that's where i think education should go and i think we shouldn't be so about how perfect we are but we're all human and then uh, talk about how we solve problems that's that's really what it comes down to I got distracted by the dogs and the people. Oh, it's all good. I was just actually curious, during quarantine, have you spent any time re-watching any projects that you've done, certain movies or TV shows earlier in your career, or have you been watching just other things to keep your mind busy? Well, I've had to watch Maze a lot because I had to edit together examples for these, these courses, and then uh, Dave Dunlap also had one for his uh, cinema class in US, UN, University of North Carolina, which is really good. And so uh, it, 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 it's, it's taught me a lot uh, about communication, which you can and can't do, and how to get ideas. I've done that, but more importantly, I, I've never had time for myself. And it's an abundance of time, it's wonderful. And so I've been watching all these shows that I've never had a chance to do, but things that are cool that I was like, wow, that's really good stuff. Peaky Blinders, oh my God. What a great show that is. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, third season of Ozark now. I just, story, storytelling and, and how you incrementally give ideas and, and cause the audience to want to know answers and get frustrated. and You're constantly being manipulated, but when it's done skillfully, that kind of stuff. I just like seeing other examples of really well done stuff instead of crap, you know, stuff that people don't think about or let's just shoot this and shoot that and shoot this and we'll fix it later. And, you know, if the actors don't say it, we'll just use a tape. You know, the, you know, it's like, it's so much better to figure things out when you're doing it than waiting till later. Um, that's my opinion. My dog is smelling the peaches right now. Oh my God, do not eat those Well, peaches. I have to say that's something I feel like, again, maybe people that aren't in the industry, um, it's hard to get a real perspective on is that when you're, part of the team that's making these TV shows, making these movies that you see in theaters, you might be doing that all the time. Like, you know, for more than 50 hours a week, more than 60 hours a week. So there's not a lot of time to actually see kind of what other shows are like, what other things are out there. So to actually have the time now to kind of see what else is happening in the world too, is I know it's been exciting for me as well to revisit projects or like- I've Well, look, we're doing there. this thing. You're doing this thing. Yeah. You're, you're interacting <laughs> with people. You're asking questions. You're getting, you know, I, I realize that that's what should be part of our life if we can figure it out. Uh, you know, not to get into the routine of the day to day and you think only what you think and you don't think beyond that. Um, I think it's, impo it's impossible. Our brains are meant to learn and expand. And if we just, if you get on a job and you stop thinking, uh, I can name a show right now, an example of it, I'm not gonna. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's like, uh, it's where elephants go to die or something. I don't know. I just. <sighs> We all need to, to, to have a, a life and we all need to make money. And it's such a hard balancing act sometimes figuring out uh, how to get on those jobs that take your mind to a different place. And if you're not on that kind of job, how to, how to constantly keep your mind thinking and alive. And well, if I were in charge, what could I do in this situation? I remember I was on a job once and uh, 
I had told the gaffer that I wanted to learn how to light. And uh, so um, when we got more comfortable one day, he said to me, why don't you, why don't you how do you want to light this? He said it to me. Um, the deep unit was in on it. I mean, it's not like I'm going, and I said, he said, I got 47 lights, you know? And I said, well, can we do this and this and that and that? Can we put that in there and put that? Okay, let's do that. So he, <laughs> he did all these things. And then we, you know, sometimes we didn't have time to do this, obviously. Sure. Other time, you know, or right before lunch, you know, I'd do something. He said, well, now what's going to happen when you do that shot you said you, you were so cool with, right? And you want to pan them around, push them in. Now you're going to get in the other room. And now the wind is over there. What do you want to do? And he said, don't be afraid to do things that you think are wrong. You know, like cross key, like like switch the key. What, it's a television show. What's going to look good? It's a television show. Now, I'm not saying you do that on a feature, but yeah. he, I mean, he, he, he gave me Gene Angles. He, uh, he, he doesn't realize, I mean, he, he doesn't take compliments very well, but he, uh, he taught me a lot about lighting and, and, and how he sees it. And then I built upon that knowledge and would ask questions of other people. And slowly I became more confident in my own sense of, of lighting. So now I feel like I'm very helpful. You know, I can, I can do things for myself, obviously, but... But like when I work, uh, I just been on this project with Darius Kanji uh, for Apple streaming um, uh, and another, yet another Stephen King thing that we got cut off right before our big final scene that was a month left of shooting. And the set is still there and at a pool in a forest set. And we were supposed to have 400 extras or 300 extras. And, oh. <laughs> um, and uh and like I had to go pick up my equipment yesterday because I need to start working on some stuff. And uh, it's like Chernobyl. It's like everything just ch gone. The cigarettes are still there, coffee cups, and everything was ready to go for the next day and it just gone overnight. But Darius uh, Kanji is, is a force to be recommended. He's just about um, uh, what is truthful and what is beautiful and what I've never shot as dark as I've ever seen and using that Alexa 65 and that sensor on the steady cam with a wave. And I can tell you how heavy that is, but regular operating on cranes and stuff like this, everything is so dark. And it, it was to me, uh, an epiphany of possibility because, mm. you know, if you're just used to everything being lit, that, 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 that you do this, but he gave that whole film personality. And, um, he gave me the best compliment I've ever had from a DP, which is um, such a such a talented DP. He came up, he's very huggy. He's a huggy person. So. Oh, is he? But he came up and hugged me. He said, you make all my frames and all my lighting better. And mm. it got me, I mean, I could cry because that's what we live for, is uh, figuring out if we got into a place where we are able to see something and make it better and help those who are on a very high level achieve even more. And uh, that's what pushes me to keep going as long as I can, because I, there's not a high more than, I remember saying to everyone saying, um, why does the prop lighthouse have to be on as I pass through the set the first time? Because aren't we now thinking about that instead of thinking about the actor and exploring the space, he said, oh yeah, let's turn that off. So now I'm getting nervous because I suggested something and the director was like, so we went through it and take the actor, the, she goes all the way and comes back and whenever she hears something, she, everything's very slow, it's very unmazel like Single takes, very slow, very, and then coming around with her and then coming back into the room was a really good actress <laughs> but um ending up and then she notices something again coming back and then just as we're about to find that uh lighting thing again the the lighthouse it comes on she notices and came in and leans in and uh 
that's an example. Look, maybe the article get written about how they did this and this is how they did it. But the truth is it didn't happen that way. It was like all of us working together trying to solve problems. That, my problem was a huge flare and, 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 then, yeah, and then starting to think. And people who give you permission to think, to use your brain, to be neck up um, and not see that as a problem. And that's what I want. I want to work with people who are neck up and, uh, you know, have ideas and then uh, choose the best answer. That's the way you succeed, I think, in life. Um, and choosing to work with people like Darius is another. <laughs> um, if you can choose that. But uh, um, that's what I have to say. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time. Uh -oh, I know we could talk mute. all day. Oh, I'm muted? You were for a second. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay. Well, I know we could talk all day. And I really do want to talk to you all day. But yeah. um, before I press the, the stop mm -hmm. recording button, I was just wondering if you could maybe say some last words about how you think life's going to be like back on set and how you think the set's going to feel like. Well, if anybody's on Facebook who, who isn't following Dave Comedies at this point, it's you should. Uh, Dave has brilliant daily discussion of what his uh, first four days have been on set oh, yeah? uh, on a show in LA. I know what it is. I'm not sure if he's allowed to say, but um, uh, my wife skillfully figured through the internet. Which but um, <clears throat> um, it's really uh, good stuff he's putting out there because it's like, this is what's going to happen. And this is what's happening. This is what works well. This is what doesn't work well. Pictures of in the mask. How do you stay cam when you can't be that? Or you have to, then you have to wear a mask. Now if you wear glasses, then you have to, you have to have goggles. Fogger. Yeah. And, and then your mask is here. So that fogs out. So how do you solve that problem of, or need contacts or how do you get, how do you, or do you get prescription goggles? I mean, there's so many things that have to be worked out for people like us who wear glasses. And if you have a beard, uh, so far, at least, I mean, things may change, but you have to shave because you have to have contact with the skin. Now, I have a lot of friends with beards, and I can like the sound of that. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, you know, two bathrooms, pods, A camera pod, B camera pod, uh, a, a bathrooms, B bathrooms, a green way for actors to walk that uh, because they can't have masks on, right? So they've gone through hair and makeup. So you have to have the PPP on, you have to all that stuff. You have to be ready for them. And they come in and then you have to figure out how to do all this stuff. And uh, um, it's going to take a lot longer. And he was saying it's a, it's a, it's a death of a thousand slashes or whatever he said. It was great. You really should read, read his okay, stuff. Okay, I'll check it out. Yeah. It's doing a really good service to all of us about what probably is going to happen. And also the things we do subconsciously that we can't get over. It's like when we're back with people, we want to gravitate. We want to talk to each other. Yeah, that's, I know what you mean. So they now have a, a pole with tennis balls, I guess, six feet. And the guy comes on and constantly reminds you. So you start to build and wow. rewire your brain for distance because you, you just can't do that. You can't, and you can't always be on set. The people were also used to be on set, ready to solve a problem. It's for the short term anyway, it's gonna be like, you can't, no one can be, can't be on set and then you have to be called. And so we have to rewire our brains to, to not always be engaged and yet then be engaged. It's gonna be challenging. Yeah. But, you know, vaccine, hopefully, you know, we'll hopefully get back to, to some sense of normal, but, I think some of this stuff is going to stay with us. So we, we, we just got to get used to it. Okay. That's well, thank, all. thank you again for your time. And I, I think we'll, we'll definitely find a new way to be innovative and imaginative to keep moving forward. I think, I think we have to, because otherwise we're going to go nuts. Yeah. Now, I'm going to go have some of those peaches and either be disappointed or over the moon. I hope the dogs haven't eaten them all. Okay. <laughs> we'll find out. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. How do we end these things? We just say bye? Yeah, I'm just going to say bye and then stop. Okay, so if, I, if you say bye and I say bye, you're going to be able to cut it? Yeah. Okay, bye.